I love it when it does that, when it says it's being recorded. And hey, everyone, if you love martial arts, Kyokushin Karate, kickboxing, mixed martial arts, make sure to subscribe, share, and comment on the Drew Spirience show that's on YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, and other audio platforms. And with that, this is the Drew Spirience show, the show that's 80% combat sports and 20% everything else. The show is brought to you by a few supporters. First, KRT Tips and Tricks with Sensei's Wesley Jensen and Darren Stringer. Secondly, the Kyokushin Shuffle podcast uh, by Sensei Patrick Pinto and his ebook available online, Forever the Student, picking the greatest minds of Kyokushin of how they succeed at their craft. Also, Marshall Way blog with uh, Senpai Scott Heaney and his show, Real Talk, what he does with Shean Terry Burkett of Ronin Dojo. And lastly, Moments Management for MMA where quality comes first to teach you about the fight game before, during, and after to leave with riches and understanding good money management. But today, my guest is an extremely important guest. I think this is probably the most important guest that I've ever had on the show to raise the bar for Kyokushin as Sosai, Oyama, and Hanshi Arniel wanted. It's been a long while that uh, I've been wanting to do this, and I am very thrilled to have on the royalty. He's from Brazil. He is the, he's won the world open weight in 2007. He won super heavyweight in 2005. He has won the, he has won the all American open five times and he's competed in MMA K1. I am thrilled and privileged to on to have coming on the show tonight sensei uerton teixeira or sensei uerton well hello drew hello everybody thank you for the invitation for to participate here it's a pleasure for me to participate in your podcast it's a bigger honor to have you because it's very important that your story is told because you never know who you're impacting, Sensei. Yes, I can see that sometimes uh, I receive a, a lot of messages from all around the world, and I sometimes I don't realize the, like you said, the impact I made, I, I make in people. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. I'm, it's it's a, it, that's and that's why I think it's important to have you on because after this. Who knows how, who we're going to impact around the world during these uh, crazy times. Yeah. Hey, and uh, it's important to have a, like, uh, sport, this, sports has this, this uh, power to make impact, impacting people. Mm -hmm. I was watching the Olympics and I felt like uh, more motivated, like, we are on this uh, in this situation now, and we, when we see athletes pushing themselves, uh, doing their best, we feel more motivated in life in general. Very, very true. So, Sensei uh, Uerton, tell me about how you found martial arts and what made you choose Kyokushin Karate specifically. I had an um, experience in. Uh, Shotokan when I was maybe three years old. I don't remember it, it was actually Shotokan because I was too young. But mm -hmm. my father put me in to train uh, Shotokan, maybe Shotokan. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, but I, I, I just trained just a few months mm -hmm. and I stopped. But when I was, but I always liked martial arts uh, movies like Bruce Lee movies. Jean-Claude Van Damme movies. And I, when I was eight years old, my father put me in Kyokushin because he was training there. When he was 18 years old, he, he started training and then stopped. And then when I, when I was like seven years old, he, he started again. And then when I was eight, he, he introduced me to the dojo where I started. That's amazing. So you said you liked uh, Jean-Claude so Van Damme. that's how I started my martial journey. 
<laughs> so I like how you said um, you liked, uh, you found Jean-Claude Van Damme films. We all say we all got inspired by Bruce Lee. What was your favorite or favorites? So that could be more than one Jean-Claude Van Damme movie. Which ones were stood out for you? Ah, at the time, both the uh, Bruce Lee and Jean-Claude Van Damme were my favorites. Mm-hmm. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Awesome. Now, what was it like growing up in Brazil and what experiences challenges, what did you, what are the experience and challenges that made you into the man and martial artist you are today? Mm, well, growing up in Brazil, it was challenging, uh, but I, I, sometimes I feel the difference when I when I'm in Japan and when I'm in Brazil, and I understand more uh, about myself when when I see this difference. Because in Japan things are too calm and like uh, you it's too safe, and you like you walk on the street and don't pay attention and cell phone look to cell phone. But you cannot walk like this in Brazil. <laughs> you have to pay attention to everywhere. It makes you more uh, aware to anything, everything. So I think uh, it gives gives to people instinct, instincts, instincts, instincts. Yeah. Yes, uh, that you can use in in a fight, or I don't know how to explain, but. I think it's important to have a little bit uh, danger in in your environment. So it may, I think it's it made me a a better fighter. Awesome. So growing up in Brazil, like, were there times where you got into a lot of street fights with like your neighbors or like your friends to like keep you like strong and alert? Yes. Uh, my last. My last uh, fight in, on the street was in, when I was 13 years old. Mm. But before that, it was almost every week I had a fight. So, so it gives you experience. <laughs> it's, like, it's, it's, like a, it's, like a, it's like a constant kumite in real life. They're like, it's like okay, <laughs> today, okay, you were 10, you're going to be fight. Okay, you were 10. Now we're speaking then, you were 10, not, now you're a sensei. But back then, it must have been like, okay, you were 10. You're gonna. You're going to fight uh, Raphael today because you know you beat his brother. Now he wants to see what you're made of. Is that what it was like in Brazil, where sometimes you even fought maybe the siblings of past opponents because they wanted to see like how good like you were like in uh, in close in uh, in a fight, basically. Yes, and uh, no, uh, I don't know. Uh, sometimes uh, the, the reason the fight started. Mm-hmm. It was like a, I don't know how to explain, but there was so I don't know why people like to fight me, but <laughs> they, sometimes they were not so big, but they started fighting with me, so I had to fight. <laughs> so, but it was uh, very frequent, frequent mm-hmm. in mm-hmm. my life, and when I was until I was I was thirteen, and then it stopped. Mm-hmm. Now, at 13, was that when you became a showdown or were you um, like a brown belt when at 13? No. Um, I started to train when I was eight, but mm-hmm. when I was, <coughs> sorry, when I was 12, I stopped it. Oh. And then I, I started again, uh, Kyokushin, when I was 16. Wow. So this time I, I was not training. I was training other sports. Mm-hmm. But not Kyokushin. Mm-hmm. Then when I was 16, I, I, I didn't stop anymore. So during that little break, do you feel playing other sports helped add to your Kyokushin game when you returned to the art? Yes, I think so. Uh, especially running or jogging. Mm-hmm. I, <laughs> my, my father made me run a lot like... 15 or 20 kilometers a day and it gave me gave me stamina and i i used to play handball too Mm -hmm. 
and uh, other martial arts I trained a little bit, uh, Taekwondo, Capoeira, and uh, it's given me uh, experience in other, uh, other martial arts and other ways to like to kick and move to fighting. I love how you said you're, it was because of your father that you were doing a lot of running. That mm. is so key to have stamina, especially for Kyokushin. Yes, uh, I don't know. Uh, it it helped it helped me a lot, but when uh, I started to study about training, uh, there are some things that we can make difference because uh, in karate we we will not like uh, we don't need to run like fifteen kilometers, twenty kilometers to have stamina in in the fight because the the way we we uh, we use the stamina in, in the way we move the muscles we we use in karate are different, but I think maybe the mentality it helped me a lot man. because we are tired when we are you are running tired and you like you can't give you wanna give up but you can't maybe this not the exercise. It helps, but the the mentality you you develop in the exercise uh, that helped me mm. in in karate. That's amazing! Uh, amazing. So you come back at 16 years old, and you're very serious. So what was the what was go what was it? When did you realize that you could take this very far? When uh, I realized, uh, when I was like uh, 18 years old, mm -hmm. I fought I I fought the South American tournament to qualify to the World Tournaments in 2001, mm -hmm. a World Weight Category Tournament. And then when I conquered this uh, this uh, I don't know. I forgot the word. <laughs> when I <laughs> when I conquered this uh, the right to fight in mm -hmm. this tournament, and then I realized ah, uh, when I was just 19 years old, so I I thought uh, I could make uh, big big things in Kyokushin. That's amazing. Now, what was in this period? Uh, in this period, this is the goal. This is okay. So. Kyokushin had its, to me, its golden era was in the 80s with, uh, with Xi'an Fiho and then, you know, with K1, with Andy Hug and amongst others. The late 90s come around and now your generation's coming up. But there's also Globe Feitoza. Can you tell me uh, what was it like to be like side by side with like with someone like Globe and then Xi'an Fiho? What was, uh, and any others that stood out to you that you helped, felt helped made an impact for you to compete i feel very lucky because when i started my when i was 16 mm -hmm. 17 i was training every day with with them with say say glaube with say say uh, shihan yuji sobe uh fabiano silva we had a strong team in, in brazil and Almost, almost everybody training in my in the dojo where I trained in Liberdade Dojo. Mm -hmm. So I felt very. For me, it was very lucky. I, I felt very lucky. And then they they brought uh, the Liberdade Dojo brought uh, Sergio da Costa and Eduardo Tanaka. So we had a strong team when I was just beginning my journey. So for me, it was very, very, very good. Very lucky. That's amazing timing when you come back in and you have all these guys you get to train with. So all the knowledge you get. And okay, so I have to ask this because every Kyokushin practitioner or real Kyokushin who knows uh, Glaube Feitoza, how quick was that? Qu how quick was that question mark kick? Yeah, it was like... Uh... It was quick, but it it was more like tricky, tricky. Uh, you can't block this uh, Brazilian kick. Like your guard is up, but 
you, you go your guards goes down you know, like you, uh I don't know how to explain but it's okay he had the way he moved uh, mm -hmm. his knee mm -hmm. it looked like a middle kick and then it turns to a high kick so <laughs> it was very tricky <laughs> that's amazing and, uh, and uh usually he kicked the your your rib first mm -hmm. And then you felt a little bit <laughs> painful here on the rib, and then he he gave the Brazilian kick. That's all. That's amazing. And uh, and then what? And so, 16 years old. You know, at 18, so you're really starting to sharpen your skills. You're starting to really realize, as you said, this is when you started to compete. Uh, and you and can you tell me about? Uh, the All American Open a bit because that's before I go into my next question about that. I want to know a bit about the All American Open. Is that uh, how does what's the what is that tournament for exactly? Yes, uh, uh, All American Open. Uh, when I participated first time in All American, mm -hmm. I was 19 years old. Uh, it was I fought in. In the same year, I fought in my first world tournament in 2001 in weight category. I I was maybe, I ended in eighth place. Mm -hmm. So I was a little bit disappointed. And then I fought in Brazil in August in all Brazil tournament. And I was second place, but I was more disappointed. And then in September, uh, it, it happens the... September 11th, mm, uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the attack. Yeah. So many people, I was not supposed to fight in All America. So, but many people from the, the Brazilian team, uh, they uh, gave up because of this uh, attack. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I entered in the team to like, uh, ah, do you want to go? Ah, okay, I want to go like this. And then... Uh, I ended in first place. It was wow. for me. It was a. Uh, I consider the the my, the most important tournament for me. It was uh, this one because it gave me more. I, I was almost giving up. I was I was having a. Uh, I was disappointed, like I said, and then this tournament gave me more uh, motivation to continue. Mm. That's amazing. So you have won the All-American Open five times. And that out of all the five times, that one is the most significant for you, the 2001? That's like the most important one for you? Yes. Okay. And even though I fought uh, like uh, more, uh, I had more difficult tournaments, in, especially in 2002 and 2003. Mm-hmm. Of 2002, I made the final with Lech and 2003 with Ospov. Mm -hmm. But for me, because of this, uh, the, the impact the uh, All American 2000 gave to my career, I consider it it was the most important for me. That's amazing. So, when you were preparing for the tournament for this tournament, the All American. Now, today we have the internet. We can go on social media if we want or any, the click of a button to like find nutrition, fitness. What was your training regimen for the All-Americans, for the All-Open? Well, all, I'm going to, I, I butchered it. <laughs> the All-American Open. <laughs> so you think, if you think you're struggling with words, I'm struggling pronouncing the tournament here. So tell me about <laughs> how you, what was your prep, what was uh, some of your training preparation for the, all your All-American Open tournaments? Uh, my preparation for all tournaments I part uh, participated was very similar. Uh, at the time I was Uchideshi in Liberdade Dojo, so I, I trained all day. Uh, usually I trained uh, on Monday, Wednesday, Wednesday, Friday, we made uh, running, like uh, sprints and stairs. Uh, and then the, we did uh, like uh, pads, pad, a lot of pad work. Mm -hmm. And the classes, two classes a day, two Kihonge because a day. And uh, Tuesdays, I used to train uh, chip training, 
Do, do you know the tube training? Tube training? Uh, like they, they... They, pronounce, they say tube training, but I, I don't know how to explain. You put the, like, uh, I forgot the word for elastic, like elastic. Oh, oh, oh okay. Band. It's like the band, yeah. band training. Resistance. Yes. Resistance band. Yeah. Yes, we did like in Tuesday and then Thursday I did a special training with Shihan Sobe. Mm -hmm. It was like, <laughs> uh, for this training I felt more nervous than when I was uh, about fighting. <laughs> because it was too hard. It was like three hours of training. Whoa. So, it was uh, basically, uh, and Saturdays uh, we trained too, so... Uh, but uh, Saturdays, usually we train it with all the team, eh? not only Liberdade Dojo, but uh, all Sao Paulo Dojos, the mm -hmm. best fighters met to make Comité. So mm -hmm. basically, basically, it was like this. That's, uh, that's amazing. Now, what was your nutrition like? Because now, like everyone, now if you look at Kyokushin competitors today, they get a nutritionist. They have like their meals prepped sometimes if they have the fun, the money for it. What was your nutrition like for like, tournaments? Like how did, so going into these tournaments? Uh, it, if you know the old school karate, <laughs> you know the, the nutrition is like uh, you, you should eat as much as you, as much as you can. Like the, she has used to push a lot to eat a lot. Uh, of course, we choose uh, good quality meat, mm -hmm. no, good quality uh, uh, meals, but mm -hmm. it was like not uh, uh, not very, I don't know how to explain, but you should eat a lot like this. Uh, eat as much as you can like, <laughs> like this. So we don't have, I did have a nutritionist. nutritionist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That makes that's understandable, but but still, but at the end of the day, I guess it was basically take their advice, put it into your training, and then see where it goes. Is that what it was like for um, for back then? Yes, yes. And then uh, we, uh, I don't know now, but before when uh, at the time uh, we went to when we went to restaurants with Shihans we had to show how much we can eat and uh, it was like uh, i always felt like uh, i have to go to restaurants again <laughs> like this and then we we thought it was the correct way to mm -hmm. get strong so we i tried to reproduce that in uh daily life too i i push myself to eat a lot but when i start we start to study we see like uh, it uh, it was not the best way to get strong but mm -hmm. it was the mentality we had at the mm -hmm. time that's amazing and did you have a favorite so you know when you talk to fighters they always have like a specific meal they'll eat like it has some are very the word is ritualistic they need to have their rituals like sometimes like they'll have their coach wrap the bandages around their hands specifically did you have like a meal ritual like a specific meal you always had to eat before fighting no no because uh in international tournaments we we can't choose like uh if you fight in japan we receive a uh, obento in world tournament mm -hmm. so it's same to all athletes and uh all american in all America, we could uh, choose, but it was not like uh, I had to eat this. No, for me, it was okay. Okay, that's good. That's awesome. So now, you know, you've won. So basically, the All-American Opens, you've won five times. You know, you're, you're really putting your name on the map now. Like, this is, this is like we're in the mid-2000s. And uh, the internet is kind of blowing up, but it's not blown up yet. Like YouTube just came out. So you won the World Weight Category Tournament at Super Heavyweight in 2005 and the World Open in 2007. What were your emotions after winning the two most prestigious titles in Kyokushin Karate? And 
yeah, just like, let's start with that. It's a two-parter question, this one. Yes, uh, when I won the World Tournament uh, in my weight category, it was like uh, one step for the World Tournament, the World Open Tournament. Uh, at the time, I faced Lecce uh, for the second time. I, I fought him in 2002 and then in 2005 again. And he was uh, like, in this tournament, he was knocking everybody out in, <laughs> in his side of the, the draw. And I was like uh, winning by points in the other side. Uh, I had one. I I won one fight by KO, but mm -hmm. I the other I, it was by by points. And then when when we met in the final, it was like uh, my opportunity to I, I I couldn't let the, this opportunity uh, escape. I had to take this uh, tournament because for me it was one step to win the world tournament in 2007 mm -hmm. so we had a, a fight that uh, many people uh, even now enjoy to to watch i think it alechi is a very nice guy i love i love this guy <laughs> and uh yeah yeah uh for me it was a very important title and a big step uh, for preparing me to the World Tournament in 2007. And then in 2007, I was expecting to fight, to meet him again in the final. I thought he was going to final, but uh, he lost to Karpenko, Ilya Karpenko, Ajoda Moshgiri. And then I met other great guy in the final, uh, Jan Sukup. We became... Uh, very good friends, even now, sometimes we talk. Uh, and uh, for me, it was a, a made, make, uh, making a dream come true. Mm -hmm. I was dreaming about uh, become a world tournament since I, was, since I was a little boy, when I was 10, 11 years old. So for me to conquer that in when I was uh, 25 years old it was a a dream come to, coming true that's amazing were you what was uh what was the emotion like when you won it and you uh for two so i'm gonna go back and forth here on it for the year so what was the emotion <laughs> when you won in 2005 at super heavyweight like the first time around like describe what was it like when you found out you won and who was the first person you called back home to say, I did it. I, I accomplished my goal. The emotions, uh, it was like, uh, it's, it's funny, but when the tournament, when the first, the first day, first two days after the tournaments, I always feel relief. <laughs> I always feel like uh, I worked a lot and, everything went like uh like i planned or like uh it ended good so i felt relief and then the, in the third day i started to feel like very proud and, and happy but first two days i feel relieved and i uh take care of the injuries <laughs> but uh I don't remember if I called somebody, but may, I think maybe my parents, but I don't know. I, in 2007, my parents were there. In wow. The, yeah. But 2005, no. Maybe I called, I called them, mm -hmm. but I don't remember. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Um, and the tournaments were always held in, now, they have one in New York. Were they both held in New York, these ones, or were they held in like, in like another, in, does it change every year where they put the, these kinds of tournaments? No, the World Tournament is always, always in Japan, mm -hmm. and the All American always in New York. So I okay. went to New York only for All, Amer All American tournaments. Interesting. Okay. I just want to make sure that like, I understand like, how it works, but the, the World Tournament, wow. Just, so you fought Lechi, and then you fought Jan Sukup, and the preparation you had, as you said, you know, you were doing like your program, but did you have like other preparation? Like, 
mentally? Like, do you like talk? Did you have like, like say like a coach or a teammate that would make sure that you're disciplined, you do your routine to make sure you're always prepared? No, uh, I did at the time. I didn't have contact with this uh, this kind of tools like uh, mm -hmm. uh, mental training, mental coaching. I I I started to learn about that after I, I uh, when my career finishes. I I, I like discovered this. Mm -hmm. I didn't know about anything about. Uh, I used I used to read a lot of books about, mm -hmm. but not about mental training, but uh, samurai and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So this kind of mentality helped me in, in the fights. But uh, if I had a contact, if I knew before about the mental training, I th I think it was it would be good for me. It's amazing. That's amazing. So you said you read a lot of books. You said you've read books about samurai, mm -hmm. which I mean, everybody loves in Kyokushin. And okay, so this is uh, what I want. This is something I, I have to ask because our era, we grew up, we had a lot of anime. Like we had Street Fighter, we had Dragon Ball Z, uh, Roroni Kenshin, amongst uh, other fighting animes. Um, were there any that like you like grew up on that like how that, that kept you like motivated in Kyokushin? Yes, I like it to watch uh, Dragon Ball. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> Since I was like uh, 16, uh -huh. I, before I go to my training, I watched Dragon Ball and then <laughs> I think I, maybe I trained better because I watched it better. <laughs> Awesome. Awesome. That's a, that's amazing. So you, so that, that, yeah. And Oh, we also had the video games too. There was street fighter. There was Tekken. Did you have, um, and, and those, and if you played fighting video games, did you have a specific fighter or were there fighters that you like to choose? Cause you knew you could dominate with them in the video games. I was not good player, mm -hmm. But uh, when I, I like it in Street Fighter, I like it to choose uh, Ryu and Sagat. Mm -hmm. And in Tekken, I like to choose. Uh, I don't. I forgot the name of the characters, but Jin Jin Kazama. Yes. Yeah. But I was not. in Tekken, I was so so. But in Street Fighter, my brothers always always destroyed me. So. <laughs> Tekken is a very hard fighting game. It's not like Street Fighter. I, there's more strategy that's needed for Tekken. So mm -hmm. I, I know exactly where you're coming from on that. But those are good choices of fighters. And funny, funny fact is, Jin trains in Kyokushin. If you remember Tekken 4, Tekken 4 is probably the best one in the whole series because mm -hmm. you find out Jin trains in Kyokushin and he does the the Pinan and like some of the one of the katas when he wins when you win fights with them. So it's just uh if you if you play Tekken 4 I'm sure you remember seeing that those uh katas and those moves. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I remember. Awesome. So you now 2007 so for between 2005 and 2007 you're on the top of the world. You've um become the soup so in 2005 for your weight category you become the super heavyweight champion but then you win it in 2007 the whole thing what was the impact you felt that you had on brazil kyokushin do you feel these wins helped elevate kyokushin for brazil yes i think so because uh we came from uh uh like uh history of mm -hmm. fighters, uh, good fighters like uh, Ademir da Costa, then Shihan Francisco Filho, Cece Glaube, Feitosa, and mm -hmm. then I continued that. So it was important to uh, keep the, the fighters motivated, keep the, the, not only the athletes, but mm -hmm. the students motivated. So I think the, my titles helped to achieve that 
Beautiful. That's amazing. I love hearing that. I love hearing how you used your titles for the better. Like you were really practicing so size uh, vision, which was raise the bar and grow the art worldwide. Yes, I think it's uh, when we are fighters, we, we, we have to think about ourselves. We think like we think uh, in a selfish way, but mm -hmm. Uh, at the same time, it's for uh, we we are we know we are representing something bigger than us. I I don't know how to explain. It's selfish because you have to take you have to think about your train, your career, only about your nutrition, yourself. Uh, like uh, most of the time, in the in a day. You don't meet friends, you don't meet uh, mm -hmm. family, but I, at the, uh, but we, uh, I forgot. Okay. <laughs> I'm forgetting the word. That's but okay. uh, we, you know, you are representing something bigger, and you are doing something uh, important, not only for you, mm. but for who you are watching, who are watching you, and. Mm -hmm. who are training with you so i think it's uh interesting awesome <laughs> so now 2007 is ending and you decide to get into m to k1 and then eventually mma so this is like now you're you're trying a new venture how hard was that transition to k1 and mma for you yes k1 uh i received i received the invitation uh, after the actually i received this invitation in 2003 mm -hmm. after my world tournament when i was uh when i finished in third place mm -hmm. k1 wanted to hire me but i wanted to uh win the world tournament first and then go to k1 and then i had received again this invitation and then i entered in k1 it was uh, for people who watch like stand up fighting it looks very similar but for me it was very very different the stance the the size of your stance i i like in kyokushin i like to make a big stance and then in kickboxing the stance is not so big uh, the distance between the the opponents to punch to kick the way you punch the way you kick it's all different the way you block so for me it was really difficult uh it was but my mistake it was uh, because i i couldn't connect what i had already to what i'm i was going to to do i couldn't connect my connect my kyokushin to fight kickbox I learned how to connect this this knowledge I had to kickboxing in Holland when I spent two months training there in 2010 mm -hmm. with Andre Manard. And uh, so finally I could uh, improve my kickboxing because I could find the connection between the Kyokushin kickboxing. Because uh, the kick, Dutch kickboxing, the, their origins, are Kyokushin. Mm. So I could finally understand and uh, make this connection. The training in, I had in in Japan was good. It was very good. Uh, I had trainers like Mauricio da Silva, uh, Jason Vemu, uh, Fai, and he, they they used to train uh, top fighters like Francisco Filho, Glauber Feitosa, Ray Sefo. So the training was very good, but I was not finding the connection with, uh, what I had to what I, I, I had to do in kickboxing. So uh, uh, when I went to Holland, I could find, finally understand this, make this connection. It was very interesting. That's amazing. And, and then you get into MMA eventually. So how did that happen? And what and what was it like going from Kyokushin to NTK1 now to like a completely different beast? What was that like? Yes, uh, MMA, it was 
very difficult because when we have to learn uh, something uh, completely new, like I, I never had uh, training grappling mm -hmm. in my life, and we start with 30 years old, <laughs> so it was not very easy to, to do. So, but uh, I think if uh, I had, I had a lot of injuries when I started MMA. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, when I complete, uh, completed 30 years old, it was like a, my body didn't recover for, from training like before. Mm. When I, I trained uh, one day and then next day, it was like a big sacrifice to train again. And so it was, MMA, the transition for MMA for me was very difficult mm -hmm. because of injuries, because I, I didn't have uh, the, my body didn't recover so quickly. So it was, and then uh, Jiu Jitsu techniques, uh, grappling techniques, it was really difficult. Totally understand. And it's like, so it's like, it's definitely a new, um, it's a new challenge. And at least, hey, you, you fought, you made it. And I mean, that says something more than uh, everyone says, because a lot of people say, I bet I could be a fighter, but they don't know what it takes. And you were able to get in there. And, you know, what was it like to, to get the call to say, hey, Uriton, can you fight for Bellator MMA? What was that? feeling like ah it was really uh i felt like uh finally I, i'm fighting again in high level mm -hmm. in, a, in, in a different sport but in high level again so i mm -hmm. felt more motivated to train and uh to fight again mm -hmm. but it was a little bit short career because i <laughs> fought only once and then i uh, because at the time I was in a team in Brazil named Corinthians. Actually, they are a soccer team. Uh, one of the main soccer teams in Brazil. And they have a division that uh, take care of MMA fighters. And they do a lot of uh, exams in the fighters. And then they found some, something weird in my heart exam. Mm -hmm. So I had to start, I stopped to train for three months. And then I discovered the uh, arthrosis in my toe, my, my, I forgot the, when. Uh, Take your time, it's my okay. My foot. Oh, Not okay. foot. Uh, ankle? Yes, yes, yes. Arthrosis in my ankle, so I can't, I, if I kick with my, my right foot, I feel like I I can't walk in like in two weeks I can't walk like it's uh, I can't kick anymore with my mm -hmm. my right foot. I think uh, something similar happened to Pete. To Peter Ertz. No, he's Smith. You know, Peter Ertz used, uh, used to put Peter Smith's uh, name in her, his shorts. Yes. Yes. So uh, I think same happened to him. That's why he, he retired very early. Mm. He was a talented fighter, mm. but he had like a similar uh, injury. So he can't kick anymore. <laughs> <laughs> he couldn't kick anymore. So he retired. It's so, uh, yeah, for me, it was like, uh, I think I could have done more in MMA, but uh, many things happened, so I couldn't train anymore, <laughs> so, so I stopped it. You know what? At the end of the day, you still got there, and that's something that you should be very proud of, no matter what, because not many people can make it to the level you did, whether it's for Kyokushin, MMA K1 it's it's under it's 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 basically like unheard of you know and that's something you should always be proud of no matter what like you're you, know, you can ne don't you can't let anyone ever say anything you've you've done it you know so that's something I just want to say I really 
have to say like it's you, you you've accomplished so much so you deserve to do whatever you want to do next yeah we are uh for fighters we always think uh we we should have done more and or we can do more like always <laughs> oh, <hey. my> <laughs> Hello. How do I say hello, hello in Portuguese? Hi. <laughs> hello. How are you? How are you? <laughs> I'm good. How about you? How are you? How are you? No, we'll I, <laughs> I'm great. How about you? I'm great. I'm great. <laughs> She's so cute. <laughs> Uh, how how old is she? She's three years old. Oh oh, she's gonna she's gonna be talking five languages soon. That's yeah yeah. Oh god. <laughs> Actually, she prefers to speak uh, Japanese. Wow, really? Yeah. But she and then uh, she prefers Japanese and then English and then that's in, in the last Portuguese. <laughs> Perfect. Awesome. Well, that was amazing. We got a little surprise visitor. I love it. It makes the show better. Um, so now, now that you've uh, done what you have to do, hey, she could come in. Don't worry. She wants her little, she wants her five minutes of fame. Don't worry. You know, we'll, <laughs> okay. if, you, if, she, if it makes her happy. So you were, Sensei, you were to tell me what is it now since you've, now you've like, you're not competing. What is a typical day like for you usually? Uh, I wake up in the morning and then uh, I do my training. Mm -hmm. I go to the park and run uh, body weights, uh, body weight uh, exercise, uh, kickboxing, karate training, mm -hmm. and then come back to my home mm -hmm. and then work and mm -hmm. computer. Uh, afternoons after the work, I do my yoga. I like yoga. Mm. I, I need yoga because of, uh, if I don't do my body, I feel pain in my body because of the injuries. And then uh, stay with my family nice. at the, in the night. So it's, uh, it's uh, my typical daily routine. Nice. That's amazing, man. Like that's nice way to keep busy. You're still doing it, especially the yoga. Is it regular yoga or is it like hot yoga that you have to do for you? No, hatha, hatha yoga. Okay, good. Regular, regular. It's the best one. It's, uh, it's good. Yes. It's amazing. So what, so what are your plans for the future? And would you like to teach martial arts in the future and maybe have your own academy with everything, uh, once everything falls into place? Yes, uh, I have some plans and one of them is to uh, find a way to teach my, teach martial arts, uh, karate mm -hmm. and kickboxing. I have to develop and think more about this plan, how I'm gonna do that, but uh, I'm I, I'm uh, I I don't want to do this like uh, it is it's having have been done uh, for everybody like I I want to do something different innovative so I'm planning. <laughs> awesome, I'm a, that's amazing, Terry. You know, I'm happy to see that you know you have ideas. You're always thinking. You're always in thinking. And you're a big reader too. Like I saw like, you know, like on your Instagram, you love reading. So do you have like a, a favorite book that you can recommend to me maybe that I should read? Uh, I, I, I love the book. It's not about martial arts, but I love the book name. It's uh, The Culture Map. The Culture Map. I forgot map. the name. Yes, The Culture Map. I forgot the name of the writer. Mm -hmm. It's a woman. And then she explains the differences between the cultures in the world. Like, uh, it's not only learn a new language. You have to understand why they do something, why they talk like, uh, like this or like, 
uh, why why they talk differently, uh, their behavior, and she explains uh, very very deep in this uh, this kind of subject. Mm -hmm. I started to understand more. Mm -hmm. Oh, it kind of cut out there, so I'm gonna have to. You have to tell me what. Uh, let's wait for it to come back. Yes, uh, and then uh, she she goes deep in these differences between the cultures, mm -hmm. and I could even understand better my wife because she is Japanese, so I understood how uh, why she do she does some things like like this and why I do something like this, and uh, uh, the culture map is a is a great book. I really loved it. Loved it. I'm going to have to take you up on your uh, recommendation. And that's an amazing book. So, um, and I guess that's, you know, before we conclude, I just want to say, Yurtin, Sensei Yurtin, you're you've done so much. And I just want you to know, um, it's amazing to see that you've inspired many from all walks of life, no matter their color, no matter their religion, their language. I want you to know you've done so much in that world. And like, even for someone like myself, you really like even me, just not from doing this conversation, but what I've heard and what I've read. So I want you to know, you should be very proud of everything you've accomplished and you're only getting better. This is just the beginning. So continue doing what you're doing because you have so much more to give, not only in martial arts, but in other areas of life. Thank you very much. I'm, I will continue to do my best in everything I, I, I start. I start or, or, or what I do. <laughs> awesome. So uh, sen Sensei, where can people connect with you if they ever want to like, you know, like on social media, you know, where, where, what pages are, do you have? So let's just like lay them all out and then that way I can, and then so people can blow, like your following blows up. Uh, I'm more active in Instagram, Instagram, mm -hmm. uh, Everton, the Teixeira, but official, mm -hmm. uh, but I, I have my page in Facebook, Everton Teixeira, my YouTube channel, Everton Teixeira, but I'm about to launch, uh, YouTube in English too. Nice. So, <laughs> I have to study more, I have to learn more English, but... I'm about to to start this uh, YouTube channel in English. Uh, maybe I think in September I can launch. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, yeah, I have my blog, but I have I have been having many problems in my my blog. But you can read my articles there. Mm -hmm. uh, I started I installed a plugin that can translate to English and so that's our these are my channels awesome well once again I really want to say thank you for uh, doing this it was such an honor and pleasure I hope you had a, a fun time doing this as much as I did and um, if you ever want to come on again when you have big news to share the door is always open for you thank you very much thank you for our invitation uh, it was really fun for me too and okay, uh, uh, when I have uh, big news, I, <laughs> I send you a message in Instagram and we, we do it again. Sounds good. All right, guys. So make sure to follow Sensei Iwerton on all social media. This guy is royalty and he's done so much and he's got more to offer. And uh, this show's about him. You know, I said to subscribe to, to find if you want to listen to my show, but guys, Let's give Sensei Yuritin the, the, the maximum amount of love he deserves for everything he's done for Kyokushin. Thank you very much. Thank you.